Have you got your Bibles? Have you got your Bibles? Okay. Good. If you do, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to um, the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 13. 2 Corinthians, chapter 13. Page 258. Yeah, and, and, and my Bible, uh, th this particular Bible that was bound... Uh, for whatever reason, they restarted the pages. When they got to the New Testament, they started back up with page one instead of, so that's why otherwise it would be a lot further along. But anyhow, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and uh, this evening, uh, as we have started the new year uh, in the month of January, um, fasting and praying and just asking the Lord for direction, I want to kind of um, follow up on all of that by having us go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and we'll begin reading in verse 5. So 2 Corinthians 13, beginning in verse 5. Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? But I trust that you will realize that we ourselves do not fail the test. Now we pray to God that you do not that you do no wrong. Not that we ourselves may appear approved, but you, that you may do what is right, even though we even though we should appear unapproved. For we do for we can do nothing against the truth, but only for the truth. For we rejoice when we ourselves are weak, but you are strong. This we also pray for, that you may be made complete. So the Apostle Paul, writing this letter very quickly before we pray, um, has, has encountered quite a few difficulties in the church at Corinth. A lot of issues that have gone on. This is now his second letter to them. And one of the issues that he's had to deal with in this second letter, after writing the first letter and clarifying and trying to encourage them to move uh, down the right path, is that there have been some in the church that have called themselves super apostles or just these super spiritual people that have gone into conflict with Paul and have told the church you don't need to listen to Paul. He's not even approved. Look at him. He doesn't have this. He's getting in trouble all the time, um, whether it's because he's in jail or whatever else. Obviously, the blessing is God, of God is not with him. Listen to us instead. And a, a significant portion of this second letter to the Corinthians, Paul is having to defend his apostleship. And as he closes out the letter... He says to them, now you test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. And he says, we may appear unapproved, but, but we're not unapproved. Regardless of what these super apostles are saying, Paul is saying, I know I'm an apostle from the Lord. And I know what I'm writing to you is of the Lord. In fact, we know now this is holy scripture. This is literally God-breathed scripture given not only to the church in Corinth, but to every church down through time up until our day. But the, the apostle makes this incredible statement in verse 5. Test yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. And this is a forceful, strong uh, command to them. And I, I've always looked at this scripture as uh, kind of a, a checkup for us. We go to the doctors. Um, as we grow, we go for annual or however often we go for checkups. And sometimes we need to have those checkups because we may feel like everything is fine when maybe everything is not fine. And there are things that the doctor may examine and say, well, there's an issue here with your blood work or there's something here that I'm hearing through the stethoscope or whatever it might be that lets, it, let's get this straightened out. The Apostle Paul says that we need to test ourselves from time to time to make sure we're in the faith. Now, this is not a questioning your salvation every day or every week. I don't believe as Christians we need to be doing that. That's, that's not the point of this at all. But there is a point to also not kind of sliding to the other side of the scale. The one side is constantly being unassured. I don't know that I'm saved. Coming up to the altar every week. Oh, I need to be saved. I need to be saved every week. We don't need to do that. But the other side of that is people that get so self-assured that they're never really putting their hearts before the Lord. They're just, ah, oh, no, nah, me and God are tight. We're like this. Everything is fine. 
Um, you know, even though maybe our life or our heart is really not standing up to the test, so the Apostle Paul says, no, let's test ourselves. So what does it mean to test ourselves? And tonight what I want us to do is to consider seven questions that will help us really a self-discovery test for us to see where we're at spiritually. And I always find this a beneficial exercise. It's not something I do every week or every month, but it is something from time to time that I think we need to come back to and to make sure, because the Apostle Paul says in that ninth verse, one more time, he says, we pray what? That you may be made complete. And this is actually a phrase that is found several times in the New Testament. It's not just here, but about four or five times we see where this phrase, that you be made complete. Not that you already are. Yes, we are spiritually, but there's also a growth in the Lord that you may be made complete. There is a growing in the Lord. I hope we understand that. There's a, a, a growing in our, both our knowledge of the Lord and just in our relationship with the Lord. A couple that is first married has one kind of relationship, but a couple that has been married 10 years hopefully has a stronger relationship, 20 years, 30 years. And so we grow in our relationship with the Lord and we want to be made complete. Amen? So tonight I want to take you on this, um, this journey with me seven questions that we need to ask ourselves. This is not for your spouse, it's not for your child, your parent, your friend, the person behind you or in front of you. If you take that tact and say, boy, I'm glad they were here, they needed to hear that, then, then you'll miss the point. The point is for us to be honest with ourselves. And so with that said, I'm gonna ask you to pray with me. Let's bow our heads and pray and let's just believe the Lord together. Heavenly Father, I ask that by your Holy Spirit, that we would learn to test ourselves, that we would allow your word, that we would allow your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts tonight. Lord, we need this. We need to have eyes that really do see and ears that really, truly do hear what you would say to us. And I pray tonight we would do this, that, this, that we would see this as beneficial. This is, this is a, good, a good exercise for us to engage in tonight and I pray that it would be spirit led that it would be completely biblical and Lord that we would just allow you to make us complete that we would continue to be made complete in and through Jesus Christ we give you this time we ask these things in Jesus name amen and amen um, A.W. Tozer encouraged us to consider seven questions. These are not the ones I'm going to give you, but these are seven uh, thoughts that if we answer them honestly, it will speak to us about our condition before the Lord spiritually. And these are, are, are the seven things that, that he kind of throws out to us. He says, ask yourself, what do you want the most? That will say a lot about you. What do you really want the most? That'll say volumes. Number two, what do you think about the most? What do you think about the most? That says just a ton. But now we have, and let me stop right here again. Be honest. The, the, the most important thing we can do in this tonight is to make sure that we are honest. And sometimes, you know what we might need is a family member, a person that we know loves us and really only wants our best. We might, on some of these, want to go the, to them and say, what, from the outside looking in, what do you think? that I want the most? Or, or what do you see me thinking about or talking about the most? Because sometimes we can get skewed and convince ourselves that, oh no, I'm, I'm not over there, when really maybe we are a step over there further than we think. So, but this honesty is the most important thing. So, what do we want the most? What do we think about the most? A third one that's super practical. How do we use our money? Super practical. How do we use our money? This says just, everything about us really does because a person that talks the talk in church I love the Lord but their pocketbook doesn't travel along that same line says that uh, you know the old saying money talks and uh, <laughs> and everything else so really and truly how do we use our money you can't you can't escape the reality of that number four is what do we do with our leisure time we all have to work we all have to 
eat and there are certain segments of the day that we all are engaged in the same thing, they take our time, uh, but when we have leisure time, what do we do with that leisure time? This is gonna say a ton about us. Um, the fifth one is, what company do we enjoy? Now these are just the ones that, that A.W. Tozer gives us. I'm gonna give you something similar, okay? But these are, the, these are good ones to begin with. So what company do we keep? Who do we hang out with? That's gonna say a whole bunch about us. The sixth one is, who and what do we admire? Who and what do we admire? Where, and to admire is to just, uh, it, it, it's just below this area of worship just to say, wow, that person, or wow, that thing, I just really admire, I'm, I, there, there's just, there's so much there in that person. Or I just, I mean, we hold that person up or we hold that place or whatever it might be up. Who and what do we admire? And then the last one is really an interesting one that, that A.W. Tozer came up with. He says, what do we laugh at? Hmm. What do we laugh at? That actually can say a lot more about us than we realize. It really can. Because the world will laugh at things that the believer should not laugh at. Can I get an Amen. And there are things that we may laugh at that are just, that are, are genuinely funny or, but, but in a clean way, in a wholesome way, that the world, ah, that's why are you laughing at that, that's nothing. And so what do we laugh at is a, is a good indicator. So those, with those things in mind, I want to offer you really questions, but more so just signs that you and I might need a little help in our spiritual checkup. So these are our seven signs that might indicate to us, okay, I, I need to get before the Lord and I'm going to let the Lord make me complete. I'm going to let him continue to work on me. I'm not going to stay static or stay in my place. You know, we always want to be moving as Christians. Christians should never just be, boom, spiritually, we're in this place and that's where we're going to stay the rest of our lives. No, we want to, we want to keep moving forward in the Lord, always pressing on. Amen? So here are, the, here are the seven signs that you might need, um, let's say, a little personal revival, a little work of the Lord in your life. Number one is this one. You are entertained by things that once grieved you. You are entertained by things that once grieved you. It's a, it's a super incredible thing when we are first born again and saved. Do you remember that? The joy that came with that, the boldness that came with that, the excitement that came with when you were first saved. We wanted to get into God's word if we're truly saved. If you're truly saved, you want to get into God's word to one degree or another. You show me someone that claims that they are saved, uh, I was just born again, and they have no appetite for the word of God. I'll show you somebody that was still born. That's a baby that was still born. It doesn't eat, it doesn't move, it doesn't do anything. It basically was born and it died immediately, or it was dead in the womb. If a baby is alive and healthy, it's going to want to eat. It's going to want milk. So for you and I, when we're first saved, we're excited about getting into God's word. We're excited about having this relationship with the Lord and being able to speak to the Lord and him speak to us. We're excited about growing in him. And when those things happen, usually there are some... Uh, some red blinking lights that will come up on our life that all of a sudden we'll see some things that, okay, yeah, that needs to change. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's the things that entertainment that we have consumed that, we, that, that has been important to us. Could be a lot of different things, but when we're first saved, we say, wow, these things have to change. And we change them. I remember when I was first saved, there were things that I began to change in my life. It took a little bit of time. The Lord spoke to me. The Lord worked with me. When I was filled with the Spirit, even so much more, there was a, a, an even much greater step that I sensed consecration and, and, and needing to, some things to go out the window that, that I had, and I had put money into some things. Back in those days, you know, music was, was very, very big. And I had spent a lot of money on, on a lot of music and um, a lot of other things. And there were things that all of a sudden the Lord said, now that's become too important to you. Or I began to listen to some of that music with a hearing ear that all of a sudden I'm hearing things that before it's almost like I, I didn't even recognize. And now I'm like, oh, God, wow, that's really not good, is it? 
I, I, I really shouldn't be listening to that because that's not, it's just not God honoring at all. Or, you know, it could be many, many things. But when we first get saved, these things happen and, and there are things that begin to grieve us. But if we're not careful, we can slowly move back in the direction of these things and suddenly find ourselves being entertained again with things that once grieved us when we were first saved or close to the Lord. And this is a great, great indicator for us. Have our, if you would, have our internal moral or, or spiritual standards begun to slacken where at, at one time we were like, that's got to go. But now we're like, well, it's okay now. It's okay now. And we, we really, this is something that we really have to, to ask ourselves. You know, I mean, are, are you turned on by things that once turned you off? Is this now all of a sudden acceptable things that you knew in your heart? When you were previously close to the Lord, you knew that's not acceptable, but now it has become acceptable. And can I tell you something? The world keeps pushing the limits. The world keeps... I, it, I am just amazed in my 55 years on this planet, and, and some of you, you know, have me beat by a few decades, and, and some of you I have beat by a few decades, but I am amazed at how the world continually spirals downward. Just speaking with, with someone uh, yesterday who, um, it, his, his idea was just in a, a, a shop and just started up a conversation. And he's like, wow, things have really been bad, but it's going to get better. It's going to get better. And, and I, you know, I tried just very gently to tell him, well, I'm not sure about that. You know, human nature is human nature. But he was, you know, oh, no, it's going to get better. It's going to get a lot better. And, uh, you know, the world doesn't get better just doesn't. I'm not going to wake up tomorrow and suddenly find that, that all the profanities are going to be gone from all of the movies and TV and, and in, you know, entertainment and, and politics. You know, we, well, I mean, it's just been an explosion of that. That's not going to change. We're not going to have the world suddenly begin to celebrate virginity and, and, and all these things. It, it's just not going to happen. But for us as Christians, we, need, we now need to ask ourselves, am I okay with things that I used to not be okay with? That's probably not a good sign. Amen? So that's one that we, that would maybe one indicator on our checkup list that we say, okay, I need to, to do a little bit better with this or, or take this to the Lord. You know, uh, our, our peers, here, here's, you know, a thought on this. Our people you work with, are they now comfortable telling you jokes that if you've known them for years, years ago, they wouldn't have dared say in your presence because they knew this guy's a strong Christian, this lady's a strong... They're, but now all of a sudden they're comfortable telling you those things? That should say something to us. We should, but wait, why are they comfortable now in front of me whereas they weren't years ago? Or maybe family members. So, see, for us, we have to say, okay, have I changed? Where now they're comfortable when they really shouldn't be. Amen? Are you with me? All right, did, did, raise your hand if you're with me on this. Do you under, okay. Good. I just want to make sure. All right, here's number two. Are you silent where once you spoke? Are you now silent where once you spoke? So, so the boldness to share the gospel should be something that's inherent when we are saved and especially when we're baptized in the Holy Spirit. The, the, the Lord said, Jesus said, you will receive power when my spirit comes upon you. What? To be my witnesses. Are we now silent where once we spoke? Have we now allowed the world to wear us down? Where with family or friends or, or co-workers, we just now just decide, you know, I, it's just I can't do it anymore. I'm just tired or I'm just used to it. And I know I would have spoken up previously when someone would have said something. I would have, in a, in a good spirit, in a, a right way, not a self-righteous way, but in a, a righteous way, I would have taken a stand, but now I'm just quiet. If you're now silent when you used to speak, then that's, that's not a good sign. When's the last time you, you actually witnessed to someone and told someone about Jesus? I mean, really told them about the Lord. When we're first saved, we want to tell everyone, don't we? You should. When you fall in love with someone and you get the engagement ring or whatever else, you, you know, you're proud. Yeah, this is, this is the person I love. And we're happy and we're excited. Well, it should be that way with the Lord. But have we lost track of that? Do we no longer share with people? Do, no, do we no longer tell them about Jesus? Folks, it's time for the church to find its voice. Amen. 
And its voice is in the gospel. Its voice is not in all these other things. The church has a voice, but it's in other areas today. That, and it's lost its voice for the gospel. But we need to stand up and be silent no longer on the things of God. Amen? So that's an important one. All right, very quickly. Number three. If your prayer closet has cobwebs and your Bible is dusty, there's certainly a problem. So if your prayer closet has cobwebs and your Bible is dusty, that tells us something. Because no person is greater than their prayer life. Absolutely no one. The believer that doesn't spend time on their face before the Lord and in the word is quietly telling the Lord, Hey, I've got this, Lord. I've got it. I've grown enough in you that I don't need to spend time in your word today. I don't need to pray because hey, I, I've got it. Thank you for the help. I, I, I was a young un and you taught me well, but now I'm on my own. We're never on our own. I don't care how old you are, how long you've known the Lord. This is not a thing of we grow up and suddenly we split off from our parents, from the Lord, and say, well, you've taught me well, now I'm going on my own. No, 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 it can't be that way. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Notice he didn't say that has proceeded, past tense. But he says every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's Matthew 4, 4. Notice that that's now present tense. What you received years ago was not good enough. You know, I remember 12 years ago I had this great meal. Well, that was 12 years ago. If you hadn't eaten since then, you're not saying that because you're dead. You're in the ground. So, you know, it, it, where's our prayer life? Where's our, our time in the Word of God? That's going to say everything about our spiritual condition. Let's not fool ourselves into saying, no, everything is fine when we're not praying and we're not reading the Word of God. It's, it's, it's that important, folks. And when life throws a problem our way, prayer should be the first place we turn. But I ask you, is it the first place you turn or the last place you turn? When you get that, is, the fir is your first reaction, let me dial so-and-so on my phone and talk to them about it? Or is the first thing, it's not about the phone, it's about let me take it to the Lord in prayer. That'll tell us a lot about our, our, our life spiritually. So do we believe that prayer truly works? Do you say yes? yes. Then we should be praying more. If you, if you believe that, then we should be praying more. All right, number four. You're more likely to criticize your spiritual leader, like your pastor, than you are to contemplate the message. If you find yourself being someone that every time, whether it's the pastor, your Sunday school teacher, or any, any of your spiritual leaders speak to you, if you find yourself more likely to criticize what they're saying rather than to contemplate it and take it to heart, then that probably says something about you. So if you walk out of church and, and all you're thinking about is, well, I really disagreed there, oh, that was, that was really wrong, and that just dominates your mind, then that's not good. We should be going out and, and taking things to heart and saying, Lord, you, you've spoken to me here. Because criticism, folks, I can tell you, is a sure symptom of a heart that's hardening. Criticism is an absolute indicator that our heart is becoming hard. In fact, a critical heart says more about you than it says about the person you're criticizing. Every single time. So we have to watch that. Amen? Okay. Number five. This is really basic. All right. But, but it's really important. You excuse sin. If you're now excusing sin, whether it's in your life or in the life of other people, you're backsliding. You, you, and you need this test. You need the self-examination test. Sin is anything. You know, great definition for sin. Sin is anything that Jesus wouldn't do. <laughs> Think about that. If you can go in and you can sit down and watch something that Jesus could not sit there beside you and watch in good conscience, that's, that's a problem. Let's be honest. If you can listen to something that, in Jesus, or if you cannot do something that you know that Jesus would do all the time and would tell you to do, it goes in reverse too. People that, that, you know, they go to church two times a year, Christmas and Easter, and that's the only time you see them, well, that's a problem. Because, you know, the New Testament talks about assembling ourselves together and not, and not forsaking that as the manner of some is. Amen? But exhorting one another and all the more as we see the day approaching, Hebrews tells us. So it's really important. And Jesus, listen to me. Uh, Jesus set the standard pretty high. 
Matthew 5, 48, you shall be perfect, meaning you shall, you shall be in this place of maturity just as your Father in heaven is perfect. The writer of Hebrews says it this way in Hebrews 12, 14, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So holiness and perfection is impossible if we try to do it on our own, but thankfully you and I are not doing it in our own strength. We're trusting in him and allowing his spirit to do that work in us. Amen? And so are we, are we now tolerating habits and addictions? Um, what are the hidden things in your life that you wouldn't want anyone else to find out about? This is just, again, a part of this whole thing of excusing sin. Are there things in your life that you would be terrified if other people found out about them? Oh, it got real quiet. I think that means this is a good question, right? And it's so easy to excuse things, especially when we're by ourselves. To excuse things, but, but here's the thing, we're, not, we're never by ourselves. God is with us. And again, I'm not, I'm not being legalistic. I'm not when I say this. But this is the reality of it. Would we act differently if we knew 24-7 there was a camcorder on us that at any point in time that that could be broadcast to, to other people? You know, and I, I, would we make different choices? Would we make different choices in how we talked and how we walked and how we lived and what we listened to and what we read and what we, you know, all these things? If so, then that, that's a part of the test. And the Lord is saying to us, okay, now, these things, we need to take this more seriously. We, can't, we cannot tolerate these things, especially if we're saying to ourselves it's no big deal. It is a big deal. These are the things that Jesus went to Calvary for, to deliver us from, to set us free from, that, that we could be the image of Christ to a lost and a dying world. These are the things that as Christians, when we engage in these things, we, we become hypocrites, and if the world finds out, any, you know, every time there's a scandal, the world just looks and says, see there, that's what Christianity is all about. It's a big fake, it's a big farce. And whether that's from behind the pulpit, the minister, or whether that's in the pew, either way, people, I mean, the, the millions and millions of people that if you got honest with them and they would say, well, my parents, this, or whatever, and they, it would be the truth. They would say they were hypocrites. Let it not be said of us, amen? Let us not excuse sin any longer. Let's not excuse it. What should we do instead? Confess it. Don't excuse it. Confess it. Bring it before the Lord. Lord, help me. Lord, cleanse me. Lord, deliver me. All those things, amen? And we keep coming to him again and again and again. Number six. If you're looking for the mute button on this particular message, if, you, if you're like, man, I wish he wouldn't have brought this message tonight, that's probably a good sign that the Lord wants to do some work in your life. If you're, if you're, if you're squirming and saying, because remember, we read it in Proverbs, what did Solomon say? Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. I'd rather be your friend and tell you the truth, and I would rather you be a friend and tell me the truth than have, you know, the schmooze fest of, oh, you're so great, you're so wonderful when really there are issues involved. I, I don't need to be going to the doctor and having him just telling me, man, yeah, it's, everything. it's great, Gary. You don't need to do any working out. You don't need to lose weight. You don't need to do anything. You're just, yeah, and you're perfect, man. I wish all my patients were just like you. I would stop going there because I know he's lying to me. I know he is. And so, I, you know, we want, we want to be able to say the truth to one another, and we don't want to be muting the message. Amen? It may hurt us may hurt our ego or, or, or whatever it is, but we need to be told when something is off, when something is, is not right. Again, those wounds will come from those that love us the most. Amen? And we need to accept that. So if the message seems offensive to you, don't criticize the speaker. Don't mute the speaker. Cross-examine the hearer, the one that's hearing it. That's you. Amen? All right, very good. Now number seven. You just have a deep sense that there's something more. If you have a deep sense that, you know, it, it's, I know my walk is not what it should be. That's a good thing, first of all. That shows that the Lord is, is working in your heart. Again, I'm not talking about a, a, a condemning voice. That comes from the enemy. 
If you're constantly just hearing over and over again, you're no good or you're horrible and your past is being displayed before you again and again, that, that's the enemy. That's what the enemy does. He will keep us focused on our past, on all our mistakes. We know this. And if that's coming to you again and again, that is not the Holy Spirit. That, that's a demonic spirit. But the Holy Spirit will gently prod us. And he will at times. He may not be so gentle. If we're on the edge of the cliff, I don't need the Holy Spirit being gentle. I need him yanking me by the collar and pulling me off the cliff. Amen. And I'll say, thank you. Hallelujah. You love me enough to pull me out of traffic. Amen. You know? Oh, I don't want to hurt my child. <laughs> Splat. Oh, well. <laughs> Grab them. Pull them back because you do love them. So listen to me. There, the, the, is there a deep sense that we're missing something? That's the Holy Spirit speaking to us. Amen. Again, another quote from, from Tozer, he says, To have found God and still to pursue him is the soul's paradox of love. And that's so true. When we find the Lord, we still want to pursue him all the more. We love him all the more. We keep growing in love with him. We don't find him and then say, okay, now this is cool. This was nice. And now we go on to something else. No, to find the Lord is to just continue to want to find him and love him more and more and more and more. It never grows old. It never stops. Amen? Amen. Never, ever, ever. And, you know, it's, it's been almost 40 years since I found the Lord at, at an altar in a church. And yet I still want to pursue him every day more and more and more. Amen? Think about... Some of these folk in the scriptures, Enoch, he walked with God, Genesis 5, 24 tells us. We're told that Moses spoke with God as a friend speaks with a friend in Exodus 33, 11. Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up in Isaiah chapter 6. Peter watched as Jesus pulled back his humanity and exposed his divinity on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17. Paul says, I was taught by Christ himself in Galatians chapter 1. The apostle John was called up into heaven where he saw Jesus upon his throne in Revelation 20 and verse 11. We think of people like Jonathan Edwards or John Wesley and how they just turned the direction of an entire nation because they loved the Lord and they sensed that there was something more needed. In fact, if you ever have a chance to read John Wesley's biography, you really ought to read it. Because this was a man that was a part of the Anglican Church in England and actually went to college and formed with some of his friends what he called what they called the Holy Club. And so th th this man that thought he was so close with God, raised by a wonderful mother, raised in a Christian home, and did all the right things in his life, and yet on a missions trip from England to America to try and witness to the Indians... He saw a group of, of other people, believers, that at the time he probably thought were fanatics. And when the ship looked like it went into a storm, looked like it was going to go down, everyone began to panic except this one little group of people. They began to sing praises and just to worship the Lord. And that checked John Wesley's heart. He realized, wait, what do they have that I don't have? Called himself a Christian. I mean, he did. He went, he went to church, all these things. But yet when he got back to England, he finally entered a service on Altersgate Street and there as he was just hearing a message on on Romans he actually says I felt my heart suddenly warmed and I, I I truly put my faith in Jesus Christ in that moment and it was at that point that I was saved after I formed the Holy Club in, in when I was in college after I decided to take a missions trip to another foreign land after those things I finally realized and I was born again. And then it was after that that John Wesley became the man we know as John Wesley. He sensed there was something more. And he dove in for all of God. Charles Finney, when he was saved, he said it was like being baptized in, in, these, in liquid love, just roll after roll. In fact, he said it got to the point where he thought, Lord, if this doesn't stop, I'm going to die because I'm just consumed with your love just pouring over me. As he had gone into the, the, the woods to pray. Incredible. We should be jealous for those type of encounters with the Lord. And guess what? Here's the good news. God is no respecter of person. God doesn't love them any more than he loves us. We can have just as much of God as we want. James tells us that. If we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. We can grow in the Lord. So if you stopped in your pursuit of God, I, I just encourage you, let these words 
stir you. Let what you have heard tonight begin to move in your heart, in your spirit, in your soul, because there is more. There is more, and God wants us to be revived and renewed in him. And I encourage you to seek him for that. Brother Iber, I'm going to ask you to come. The Lord is not far from us, folks. Please don't think that God is so far away and I can... The Lord is right here. If we will draw near to him, he will draw near to us. I just, as, as we close, I just say to you, I'm rooting for you. I want us to root for one another, for the best of the Lord in our hearts and in our lives. We need to draw closer to him. The time is too short to play games. If you've examined your heart or you're allowing the Lord to examine your heart with any of these seven things, and you find yourself in even just one of them saying, yeah, that kind of applies to me, then let's just take a moment here to just bow our heads and just make an altar before the Lord. And this is just a beginning point to say, Lord, we've passed through a difficult year. Lord, we know that the year to come, the time to come, whatever time we have left on this earth, we know it's gonna be difficult, but yet with you, Lord, with you, Lord, all things are good. All things work together for good to those that love him, to those that are called according to your purpose, Heavenly Father. So no matter what we face, the big thing is our relationship with you. And we pray right now that you would revive us, that you would renew us, God, that you would do this work in our hearts if we have, as we have examined ourselves, if we, as we have done this self-testing. Maybe we realize we're lacking in a few areas, but God, you are more than willing more than able to come and to renew us. And I pray today for myself and for every person in this place that we would want and that we would desire more of you because I know that is a prayer that you will answer beyond any shadow of a doubt. If we will ask this in faith, God, that we want to draw near to you. It is your word. You will draw near to us. Said, done, settled beyond any shadow of a doubt. And I thank you for that. We stand in awe of you and we stand saying, Lord, more of you each and every day. Each and every day, let us grow. Let us begin right here on this date in this year to begin to say we're, we're moving forward with you. We're leaving other things behind. We're pressing on. This is a, a date that is going to live with us. Maybe we'll mark this in our Bibles. Maybe we'll, we'll put it in our journals. But we're going to say we're moving forward with you, Lord. And I thank you. Our trust and our confidence is in you. I pray you'd minister to your people today. Grant to each and every one here a seeking heart, a loving heart, and a growing heart, Lord. A heart that grows in love with you more and more and more each and every day. Do this in my heart and in the heart and the lives of every person here that wants it. I know that you will. And I thank you for hearing. And I thank you for working in our lives. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you've not given up on us. That we were here tonight for a reason. That you wanted to speak to us. And you have done that. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Spirit of the living God.